afternoon uh thank you so much for watching this podcast so today i'm excited i've got a great guest he's an amazing dude uh him and i have been talking offline about a whole lot of stuff uh but thank you so much for all of you who have been liking who have been sharing who have been posting who have been talking to me and giving me feedback continue to like this podcast uh it's only by time that we're gonna grow man so today my guest is bra jimmy how are you? Hey man, this man is a busy man, man. Dog, I'm so proud of you, man. Because whether you like, you just keep going forward, you just keep hustling, brother. Are you good? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, Thank good you to so see much. you, man. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, uh, so how you been? How you been, brother? I've been pushing, I've been pushing, you know, yeah. um, regardless of the circumstances, we just came yeah. out of COVID, you know, and it's tough for everyone, but we just keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Just keep going, you know. If you if you stop, then then you dead. You know, you just have to keep moving. Yeah, it's a, it's a continual process of growth. Anything that doesn't grow dies. Absolutely. Yeah. We just gotta keep walking. Gotta keep walking, man. Yeah. Um. You know, I want to introduce you to our people because I think you like such a dope dude who's like <laughs> such a like I was saying to you like a superstar, dog. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> Tell you the truth, I had ambitions of being a superstar <laughs> growing up, you know. Uh, maybe it's because I can see it already. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like but life just took a turn of its own, you know. Yeah. And I think it's just uh, the the initiated journey that we're on. Yeah. God's initiated journey because, you know, from the ages of nine, my friends can actually tell you some of the people that know me. They used to call me Sweet JB. Because sweet JB, yeah, JB being my initials. Okay, cool. And you know the sweets. I don't know why, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I used to be a crooner. You know, I used to sing. I still do. But what? Yeah. So yeah. Like I, I saw myself as the next Asha. What? I promise you. You know. So um, then went to study music, and then life just took a turn of its own. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's start from the beginning, bro. Um, so, Chimigi Mang, where did you grow up? And, 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 yeah, where did you grow up? Where were you born, brother? Okay, so I, I was born in Nelspreet. Yeah. I'm the son of a businessman and a teacher. Okay. So, my dad was an entrepreneur back in the 80s, started one of the first dry cleaning services in Pumalanga. Wow. So they used to supply the whole of Mpumalanga with, you know, dry cleaning services. Yeah. And then later on, he branched off into different services, um, like your, your 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 construction. He also established a bottle store at some point. So, like, he was quite a, a big entrepreneur yeah. back in the 80s. He's also one of the founding members, I think, of the Black... Uh, uh, the Black Forum for Entrepreneurs, I'll remember the name correctly, you know, so uh, Then my mom was a teacher on the other end. Okay, know? so yeah, th that's that's me. I grew up in Nelspreet and So what up with She's gonna win that Sure, sure Yes, in the someone we're just recording quickly and then this is all Puma and I can up with can we park here? Is it fine to wait for him here? Yeah, even see in the gate there. You can park in the gate there. Okay, sharp. In the boom, in the boom. Okay. Okay. Alright, thank you, but it's not live, ne? No. Uh, that's, so, that's why I said you must park. Oh, is it? Okay, cool. Because the hotel is closed for now. It's open in 30 hours. I was telling Keith that hey, this hotel is a big deal, eh? Mm. Oh, is it? Michelangelo, this is the only seven star we have in Africa. What? No, isn't there another one there? Not Leonardo Sexton. or something? No, no, they're all five star. This, not the, 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 the towers. Oh. This, the hotel. Seven star. The likes of Michael Jackson. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Nelson Mandela. Oh, so it's not working? No, it's going to open on the 30th of August. Like, you can even feel the excitement from some of the tenants in the hotel. Oh. And that uh, on the other side. Was it renovations? No, it was covered. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. All right, let's continue. All right, Abuti, so, uh, you know, we... You were still telling me about your dad, man. So your dad is a was a super serial entrepreneur. Yeah, not back in the day. Not serial though. Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> he took risks. He yeah, took risks, calculated risks, and yeah. it worked out for him. Yeah. Uh, and then my mom on the other end was a teacher. Um, she taught mostly English. Okay. As 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 she was one of the HOTs for English and. Funny enough, you know, she, one of her proudest moments was when the deputy president became premier of the province, because that was her student from form five, I think, I think to form ten. Ah. Yeah. So she, she, actually, <laughs> she actually gave me a call and said, "Yo, I know this boy," you know. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so you know, teachers and knowing all their students. You it's know, my so, student. Yes. Yes. So yeah, that, that, that that's me, and I grew up in Lausbrate. Yeah. Um, in a township called Kanyamazan. Okay. Yeah. And I spent most of my, uh, most of my primary and high schooling years there. Yeah. And then I came up here to study music, um, contemporary music. Then I started a career at the side. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was it like growing up in Nelspread? It was okay. I don't know, um... It was it was okay. It, it's it's quite a chilled place, mm. although you know it was limiting in terms of my ambition and what I wanted to achieve. Mm. So uh, the sooner I could get out of there, I did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like it feels like because most of us who sort of grew up Komachaying in the homelands in the other smaller provinces, you just want to leave, right? Yeah, <laughs> it, it feels like you know, and also the, the problem being that a prophet is never appreciated in their village. True. Yes. You know, so we've we've had to travel thousands of k's to get recognition. <laughs> <laughs> and the people you're sitting with here, yeah, you're like, guys, I live Yeah. You know? <laughs> don't you see the talent? Yeah, they don't care. So yeah, it's just one of those I think for everyone. I wonder why though. Why why is the prophet not? I mean, not. even Jesus. Jesus had to leave Nazareth. To <laughs> I guess just, you know, it, there's that issue of familiarity. Yeah, but you we, know, we know this one. Yeah, it they, can't be that. We they, know this one. Yeah. He was playing here on the streets, you know, one of those. Yeah, you know, they so, can't be that great. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, and I think we miss out on even great opportunities just in life yeah. by, with, that, with that frame of thought. Because I think life was designed in a way where everything you need is always around you. Hmm. So oftentimes we miss opportunity because your opportunity might be sitting with Sipo and you're like, ah, but it's Sipo and I know Sipo. Hmm. You know, you're expecting hmm. a Sipo from the East. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I think I think we lose out on opportunity because of that mindset also. But yeah. you can't, you, can, you know, you can't save the world. You know, you can't change how people see things. You know, yeah. Yeah. you can only do your part to influence positively or negatively, but it, it's limited to that. Yeah. So you came up to study music way exactly? I studied Joba. music at LNB. LNB? Yeah, it was a college called LNB. It was bought over by Damelin. Oh. But LNB was an independent institution that had a music course here in Bramley. Then the music course was accredited by the Los Angeles School of Arts. Okay. So, especially the vocals part, you know, so which is what I was focused on because I couldn't play an instrument. Oh. So one of the prerequisites of coming into the school was you either had to be able to sing or you had to play a certain instrument. So I just focused on the singing. Yeah. But we had kids in our class who couldn't sing. You know, I remember <laughs> RJ one time, you know, I think he lost it in class. He was one of our teachers. Yeah. And he said to these girls, I can't teach you how to sing, man. <laughs> it's either you, you got it or not. <laughs> So yeah, that's uh, that's what I did in college. Yeah, and then that gave me an opportunity to get onto radio. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. I okay. work for Trans Africa Radio. Oh yes, I know Trans Africa. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, is it still up here? In Park Town. Yes, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so yeah. during my college, later college years, I worked for Trans Africa Radio, mm. which exposed me to a whole host of industry professionals. I mean, I was fortunate enough to interview Lebu. Matos? Yeah, in studio. Oh, what? I was, I, 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 I was so starstruck, man. I remember at some point <laughs> asking her like 10 questions at once. <laughs> But that was a great experience. I interviewed Lebu. I did. Um, I did an interview with Cabello. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, Mabalan. Mabalan. Yes. Yeah, we did Cabello. I'm just highlighting the ones that really mattered to me. That stood out. Yeah. yeah and then there was WHP. And that's what? How, yeah, that's how we we struck a friendship with him. I actually used to co-host with his late wife, Lerato. The no mother way, of his child. No. Yeah. I, she she was my co-host before. They got married. Yeah, well, oh, while they were... Jabba brought Lirato to me because at first I did oh. an interview with Jabba, and yeah. Jabba then liked the show so much, and then he said, "Yo, man, my girlfriend it was a girlfriend at the time." Yeah, Liamo, I think was still very young. She was two or three, and she she was, she was like, "My girlfriend is passionate about radio." So okay, she, it came, turns. she came through. She was amazing. So it was me, Lirato, and a guy called Ranzo. Okay. So we ran that show. It was called the Jimmy J Show. Oh, yeah? One of the only <laughs> live shows on the station because the show used to do pre-recorded shows. Oh, yeah. So we had our own show from 3 until 6 on weekends. Yeah. Which was then syndicated to all the African countries and played on the DSTV bouquet. Yo, dog, that's big, man. Yeah, so we, I, I really enjoyed talking to Lebo. Yeah, that was, that's like the highlight because I think about six or five or eight months later she passed on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What did you speak to her about? Everything, man. I yeah. mean, like her career. Yeah. Um, like I said, I got starstruck at some point. I asked <laughs> about ten questions at once, but she was really cool. You know, yeah, she, she was really cool. She could see her eye, and she she was not the person that you would see on stage. Really, eh? yeah. She was like a really calm individual yeah you know, really closed off you know it felt like you were bothering her when you were asking questions <laughs> but she was cool she yeah was cool yeah so how does it feel to have spoken to two greats who are no longer here man? no camelo is still here man i mean oh Jabba, Jabba. Yeah. Jabba. yeah look the Jabba thing was really painful for me yeah know, because um besides the issue of depression mm. Jabba was cool you know, Jabba was a really cool guy, and um, I was fortunate to know him personally. Mm. So even when the whole story about him being depressed came out in the paper, I phoned Lirato, and I said, what's happening with Jabba? Yeah, mm. But, you know, that's a story for another day, but, you know, it, it shouldn't have happened the way it did, and that mm. was very painful for me because I felt to Uti, you know, he told us he had a problem, but no one paid attention to it. Because mm. mm. even in response, uh, when I called Dirato, she was like, I don't know what's up with him. But also, she, she had her own reasons. Mm. You know, she she might have been hurt by the guy or whatever. But when I saw that in the paper, for me, I felt there was a cry for help. Mm. And when what happened, happened, it was very painful for me. Hmm. And like on Lebu's part, man, it's just an honor to have sat in the same room with her. Hmm. You know, hmm. I, it's like I say, it's one of the highlights of my radio career. I mean, I've hosted a whole host of people there, your Slilo Slaughters, you, you know, but the Lebu part just stands out for me. Yeah. yeah. Do you think, I mean, on, on a Jabba issue, do you think, um, in fact, I was talking to another artist, he was saying, 90% of artists will suffer depression. Yeah, it's a it's a very cultural industry, you know. Um, yeah. Part of the reason why I, you know, I, 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 in between 2005 and nine, you know, I had a thriving uh, production business, which I decided to take a step back on and focus on building a family. Hmm. Because I noticed, you know, during those years, even, you know, I've, I've a lot of blank gaps where I don't remember what happened, where and how, you know, because of how the industry is, you know, it just gets cutthroat, gets hectic, you get busy, you're all over the show, 
So I then realized at an early age that uh, I wasn't going to be able to to have stability, and you really need to have stability to sustain here, yeah. you know. And I was fortunate enough to see an interview by this other lady that owns San Codes. Okay. And she said, you can't have everything, you know, you, you have to choose. I think she was talking to Zem and Kansani when they still had a radio, a TV show. Oh, yes. And she said, you can't have everything. You have to either have the family or have the career, you mm. know. And in this industry, people would assume that you, you can't have everything. You have to choose or something falls within the cracks, you know. Yeah. So um, I just I, I took that decision because I realized that I'm not unique in any way. I could also because depression is basically your avatar telling you they're tired of the character you're playing. <laughs> so Jesus. I just felt that if I don't create that stability, yeah, then I also will be susceptible to that, you know, and the pressure that comes with the industry to look good, to sustain, yeah. It's too so much. It's too much. It's easy for everyone. I mean, and also, I was telling Al Sikoni the other day in a meeting that the problem is that we don't prepare our artists mentally for whatever roles they need to play, even just as actors. True. Um, and True. I was referring this to the issue and that the silo shy, you know. And yeah. I was like, you look at the character that he was playing towards the end of his career, and you look at the characters that he had played before then, that can take a toll on you. Mm. You know, and mm. because remember that artists themselves also have a way they perceive themselves. So uh, the industry is not sensitive to that. Mm. I mean, Nero was telling me that the Joker, the guy that played the Joker, had to go for therapy for almost a year or two after playing that role. What? Yeah, he had to, 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 to debrief, that's what they call it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, because so, it was intense. It was intense. Yeah. So we don't do that in South Africa. We don't take our artists for therapy sessions where mm. they get to talk. Because, like, you know, I, Ricky, for example. Yeah. When I had the studio in Norwood, Ricky used to come through. So I never knew Ricky personally, right? Okay. So um, I'm learning later on that hey, they were part of the groups, Nabo Marx and all these guys that used to come there, you know. Mm. Mm. And when they describe him, and the type of character that he was of a person who would, you know, close off after after maybe productions, you know, totally what they were shooting, he'd be all bubbly, but you'd find him in a corner then trying to, you know, re, re find himself again. You know? Yeah. And um, I'd say to that, if we had any form of understanding as people in the art, then we would have been able to identify that problem and be able to help him. Because obviously it gets into character to be whoever mm -hmm. he is. So we need to help them get out of character and understand that even though you are not that character that everybody idolizes, you're still lovable. Mm -hmm. you know? So I think you're right. Everyone is depressed because everyone is going through a lot. Mm -hmm. It's just that those that will be able to survive are those with support. And if we could create mechanisms to support, mm -hmm. you know, not just the artists, but each other, then we not have as much, you know... People taking their own lives and so on. Yeah, because, you know, yeah. that's a cry out for help. I don't think anyone wants to kill themselves, you know? It's just that, like, for instance, you know, as you say, like, a guy can cry out. Ricky cried out in his music. Mm -hmm. And... But then he had this persona that people thought, no, but he's okay. He's just probably just like, you, you know... know for me, when he took off his clothes on stage, man. Really? Yeah, that was, that was it for me. I knew that something was wrong. I don't know if you remember that show. Oh. He took off his clothes and was left in his underwear. No, no, I don't remember that show. It's everywhere. It's trending everywhere. What? Yeah, so for me, that was it. I was like, something is wrong here. Yeah. He even took off his pants? Yeah, he was left in his underwear. <sighs> so for me, when I saw that, I was like, okay, look. <laughs> something is something not right. is not right here, you know. So people are crying out and we're mm -hmm. not listening. I think the problem is that as a society, we're just not listening. But also, depression is such a complex thing. Also, mm -hmm. you know, it's especially to us, what because it's like guys won't even talk about it. Mm -hmm. You won't even say or ever fit. But I, I'm not feeling okay. I feel like I feel like you know, like. Bottled in. Bottled in. And some can't even find the words to describe how they feel. Mm, mm, mm. And when you do, 
Bazoti no, I long at your son, young at he. He's acting out like why is he? You're you're right, man, you know? Yeah. Because I think it's really a misunderstood um, issue. Yeah. Yeah. And it affects us on all levels, you know? Mm -hmm. So, like, I'm really, really passionate about the issue of mental health. Mm -hmm. Um, Even the next movie that I'm doing is centered around the issue of mental health. Yeah. Because I've also lost loved ones. I mean, the first person I lost to mental health was my co-host, Ranzo. And I didn't know there was anything wrong with Ranzo. That's what really hurts me. Really? Yeah. I didn't know. You know, and, and I thought he was fine. You know? Yeah. Until, he took his own life. Yeah, until they, they found him dead. And that really hurt me. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, and then... To you, he seemed okay. Yeah, he was fine. To me. Yeah, you know, but I think I wasn't listening also, you okay. know, because it did indicate, you know. But remember that what also made it a bit complicated for me to pick it up is that then Ranzo became he was a graphic designer who I employed in the company. Okay. So for me, he came out complaining about pay, mm-hmm. you know, and I was like, "But I'm paying you enough, you know. Then cut a few things, you know. You don't need to have a two-bedroom turnout." So I thought I was. Ganti, I think I wasn't just listening to what mm. he was trying to cry out for, mm. you know. Mm. And mm. he left for my he came to visit family and didn't come back, you know. Sure. And That's then cool. there have been a whole host of other people, you know. And if I look at the pattern, it's just that we're not listening. We're not listening. Because yeah. everybody's, we, we're very self-conceited. We're thinking about our own problems, mm. our own issues. So to take somebody else's baggage, it always feels like, hey. Yeah, and it's quite unfortunate, you know. Yeah. That's why they're professionals. Like, at some point, my mom used to play counselor to people, you know. Like, yeah. And I used to say to her, don't do this, you know, because you need to first have the support yourself to mm-hmm. be able to listen to other people's problems, you know. Mm-hmm. And eventually it weighed in on her very heavily towards the end of her life as well, you mm-hmm. know. So... I think it's it, we not we we not being selfish if we try to avoid getting absorbed in other people's problems mm-hmm. because then it becomes your problem that you need to solve to get better, you know. And we're not professionals. And we're not professionals. Mm-hmm. That's why doctors drink like fish, especially <laughs> general practitioners, you know. <laughs> and they're on drugs, heavy drugs, eh? Yeah. You just wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. <laughs> Keep them going. Probably your favorite GPs on coke. You know? <laughs> You'll never know, brother. You'll never know. Yeah. Yeah, it's just to deal with the stress of listening to people's problems. Yeah. It's too much. It's too much. It's yeah. too much. So, from radio then, brother, <clears throat> where where was your next move? So, what happened is, uh, during radio, uh, one of my homeboys uh, dropped an album. They were a group. Mm. So, which then led me to Palomino because they came to for an interview and um, they were distributed by Palomino. So, when I found Palomino, it wasn't owned by, by me. I didn't found, uh, I was not the founding, founder of the company, mm. you know. Um, so, it was owned by, partially by a guy called Bongani, who's now at the presidency, mm. and then a, a lady called Karen. So, these guys were signed to Palomino for for distribution and marketing. So, Palomino has distribution with Shear and, you know, it's a publishing company as well. So, then I met them and I met these guys at Palomino and that's how I got into the business. So, then the business, my primary focus in the business was that I was doing my final year of study. So I wanted to, I needed to do an internship basically, either a record label or whatever to get my qualifications. Mm. So I didn't want to go for a major, you know, because I also wanted to stay out of the system as much as I could, mm. you know. So I then got into Palomino, helped them with the distribution of the projects because they were at that present moment when I came in, the group was just about to be released. There was a second artist there called Slovas. So he was also about to be released. 
So I came in to assist with releasing the projects, mm. you know. Mm. Um, at the time was CDs. Yeah, it was CDs. Yeah. So at that time, what we used to do is, um, so we had distribution with a company called, well, it was it's part of the share group of companies. Mm. I'll just remember the name as we talk. So what we used to do back then, when a project was about to come out, you, you had to go meet with the buyers or the distributors. So it would either be the buyers from the actual distribution shops, like your musicers and all of that, mm. or you would meet them through the distributor. Okay, sorry about that. So the distributor would then set up like a, 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 a team of buyers who would go into the retailers and resell your product on your behalf. Mm. So we'd meet, I'd meet with these guys, I think it was once a week or so, somewhere there in the, in the East Rand, and I had to come up with a plan for each project for them to consider going to sell it to the guys because they needed to also make a presentation. Mm. So I did those presentations, I did those plans for Native Squad, did them for Slovers, and I'd go there and convince these guys to, to get these guys to buy the product. So I would have to go sell the product to them. Mm. Then they take my sales pitch to Musica. Oh, okay. you know, Because that sales pitch needed to have like your plan of how the music is going to get out to market. So if you were doing any radio spots, if you were doing any TV, you include that in, mm. in your plan, you know? The PR and marketing. Yeah. So mm. I, I came in just to do that because Palomino didn't have any person that was in, informed enough to do that, you mm. know? So I'd meet the buyers almost once every week, then they'd make a decision go tell music a stock up the guys are going to be in Cape Town doing performances so the cities might move so I came in doing that I did it for four months so as I was about to leave because obviously through radio I'd made so many contacts on, on with the, radio, the record labels you know so as I was about to leave the, one of the partners approached me and said you know stay um, we'd like to do music videos as well and you know the people and I was like the only way I'm staying is if I own the company because I can do it on my own mm. you know? and if you guys are retain sh retaining any shares then we have to go 50-50 you know so Karen left and I was left with a guy called Nick mm. we went 50-50 we did most of the music videos in the industry um, and then you know, we, we got to a point where visions differed, you know, mm. and then I bought him out of the business because I wanted to continue with the company. And yeah, I continued, got onto TV ads, and the business in itself just evolved and changed into more communications. And, you know, yeah, so. That's what I got up to after 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 radio. So if I, I I focused on building Palomino. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, <clears throat> so at the time, if you look at what's happening now, come music, um, the CD sales. I mean, if you if you if you're talking, you have to meet with the distributors. God, I'm just thinking as a as a customer of of music. If a CD is like a hundred bucks. So like, and then there's like so many people that the CD goes past. So everybody adds a markup. I remember asking Lance this thing because Lance mentored me when I started out in my career. Oh, get her off. Get her off, guy. Yeah. So I remember, you know, getting my cost for the CD um, from CDT. So I remember asking Lance, like Lance, so the distributor is selling the CD to to the store for 30 rand and I'm buying the CD for 33 rand so who's paying for the difference and that said you are and I was like but that's nonsense <laughs> I didn't ask him to discard my product yeah you know but they did that you know and Musica would get the CD for 30 rand and sell it for 130 yes you know and good label 30 rand the artist still needs to share that with the record label because I could never understand the cost breakdown of a single unit of a CD. Yeah, and it, then, just, it doesn't make financial sense. 
Yes. And then, uh, but do uh, if you if you have like a record label like that, do you do you end up carrying the artist mm. for a very long time before you actually start seeing? That that's the thing. That's why this conversation where artists would say it's boom, ropi, le, yeah, it's really unfair. I mean, I used to roll with Lance and see him taking care of all of these artists, which he, he normally shouldn't have. You mm. know, um, in, mm. in my earlier career days, I'd go to Triple Nine, and you know, you'd see the struggles that that Arthur would put up with with the artists. You know. Mm. You know, Come on, they are arrogant. Developing an artist, you know, just yeah. developing an artist. Because when I used to rock up there, Chomi was still in, in her uniform, you know. Mm. And he, he take, you know, developing an artist, bro, you can't put a price to that, you know. It takes like time. I'm saying, Chomi yeah. would rock up in her school uniform there, which means this guy had to wait until Chomi was of the right age to release her. And all that effort and money put during those mm. years, you can't quantify it, you know. Mm. I'd roll around with Lance, he'd be going to give people rent money, petrol money, and you, you cannot quantify that into actual value, mm. you know, because you're also saving another man's ego. Yeah. So then for the artist to then come out and say, yeah, this one chowed our money, this one used to feed us drugs, it leaves one with serious questions of, mm. of whether is it really worth it. You know? I remember seeing the I mean there's a Netflix series or is it Showmax where it's called Behind the Label yeah I, mean, oh, I saw that yeah yeah I mean just uh, what like the self entitlement of, of artists, artists. Bro. without thinking Jorge damn it artists are the most deserving assholes bruh <laughs> <laughs> you know like I've had my fair share yeah I mean I've I've, I've had my fair share um, yeah I mean they're the most look bro <laughs> you have to be an asshole to be able to manage artists eh? yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know I've, I've had issues with certain guys in the industry in the past but in hindsight no you have to you, you have to be a beast because yes. artists are very self-entitled eh? they take 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 that's one, all they one, know how one. to do yeah they, and then you know when some like you know, it's a typical example, the issue Yaga Zahara and DJ Smith. Mm. She would not exist. And he gave her the comfort life that she had. And the, the opportunity. You to, know? Yeah, yeah. The opportunity. So, granted, you feel that you, you, you've been done wrong, but, you know, let's approach things correctly, you mm. know. Mm. The self entitlement that they come with is why this industry actually doesn't grow, you know. And I don't think I've, I, I was fortunate one time to see Kimora working, Kimora, uh, former ex, ex wife to Russell. Okay. And, you know, Kimora, as big as she is, when the photographer gives her instructions, she becomes like a little child. She takes instructions, mm -hmm. you know. And I observed that and I was amazed. and, and even observing Beyonce work, you know, mm. they understand that, you know, they're never bigger than their craft. Mm. And I think our artists in South Africa m miss out on that part, you mm. know, where they lose out on serious opportunities because mm. they think they're bigger than their careers. Yeah. Know? And wherever there's ego, man, there's failure. And also another thing is that, <clears throat> I mean, I know Casper's doing it now and maybe AK slightly, but the fact that you've got the fame and then you branch out into other things to say, okay, now I've got merchandise, I've got t-shirts, caps, maybe I've got an alcohol beverage, I've gone into partnership or whatever. A lot of our artists, if you think about all of them who were once famous, they just could not see how they can actually venture out, use the fame and actually sell other products. It's because they've never been in a position where Casper is in, where he owns the brand. Okay. That's why Zola can't call himself Zola 7. Oh, he can't? He can't. You'd think he wouldn't have exploited that by now. He doesn't own the, the brand Zola 7. No ways! It doesn't. I was wondering where the seven went. Get a seven nigga! It doesn't own it, so 
Casper was really smart. And you know the fascinating thing about Casper? Yeah. And I've been wanting to tell this story for the longest time. Né? Yeah. This dude always used to say that he was going to be the biggest artist in Africa. He did say. I met this guy at Tasso's place when Dukes was one of the biggest artists at the time. Yeah. Dukes had the hype, Morafe and all of that. Double HP was a godfather yeah. and whatever. Yeah, like. so he was at Tasso's house in Randberg one time, you know. Hmm. And these guys were actually <laughs> making fun of the fact that he used to pronounce that he would be the biggest, you know. Because yes. I remember getting there and asking, who's that guy there? And they were like, yeah, go ask him, go ask him. <laughs> <laughs> and that was his response, you know. So that's jealous, yeah, man. You niggas know, too. You niggas and being stupid. <laughs> you know? So when he blew up, yeah, um, he was distributed by this other guy I knew, the CDs, you know. Yeah. When they dropped that first CD, I said to that guy, "Look, man, this, this, you know, it's onto something. It's onto something. Not even about the music, you know. Yeah. But understanding the persona of the person behind the music." You know? He was hungry Because bro You have to believe Your own bullshit man. Yeah For it to work mm. you ha- And he believed it I think that That's the mindset Of Of great Artists and champions Yeah um, Like I remember Watching something um, Muhammad Ali Okay uh, When he started saying I'm the greatest he saw from another nigga who was a wrestler, a white guy, who used to say, I'm the best, I'm the greatest. Yeah. And then he says, if, uh, uh, and even Floyd copied that from Muhammad Ali. So, and if you think about it. Look at how small Floyd Mayweather is. Look how. And so, and every time these guys said it, everyone's like, ah, no, you can't be the greatest, you can't be the best. Mm-hmm. But then if you don't, if you believe them, then obviously your life you have, dies. You have to believe your own bullshit, man. Yeah. you got to yes. believe it, you know? Yeah. So, Casper believed this. He believed it. Even when he did the dome, man, everyone was expecting him to fail. Do you know that he's the only artist to have ever filled the dome to its capacity? Even these international acts have not done it. No, they haven't. No, they haven't. You know? So, that's major, man. Yeah, and I look up to that guy. He's he's, he's, he's amazing. And also, he's a he's a he's a businessman who, some would say, shrewd. But you have to be you have to be sharp and to 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 make a success in yeah. in this industry, I guess. In any industry, yeah, you know, um, yeah. You just have to. Business is not a game, man. No, it's not. So yeah. you have to be cutthroat. You know, I've never met any person. Even when I started, you know, getting close to Lance, people were talking shit about him. You know? Yeah. About how horrible it is. And I get fascinated by those talks, you know. So I want to discover this person myself, you know. Yeah. Like any billionaire, I was telling this other guy the other day that no one says anything nice about Robert, you know. Um, if you get close enough to people that maybe know Bill Gates, they've got nothing good to say about mm-hmm. them, you know. So mm-hmm. I guess it's the nature of business. You can't please everyone. Yeah. And you're not there to make friends anyways. It's true. You know? Yeah. And I mean, <clears throat> Jesus also suffered the same <laughs> challenges. He said, I'm the son of God. They're like, nigga, you're not. <laughs> the Jews are like, ah, uh-uh, you're a prophet. You're not the son of God. <laughs> yeah. It took us, Motagi, here all the way in the south of Africa. Believe. To believe that, okay, he's the son of God. But the Jews still don't believe it. No, they don't. Eh? <laughs> it's the whole thing about the prophet not being celebrated where they're from. You know? Yeah. But the issue of Jesus also becomes a bit sensitive. Yeah, you know, that because is. Um, it sounds controversial, but Jesus was not the only one. Yeah. Because if you remember, he had to go get baptized by John the Baptist. Yeah. So there's always very talented people within society. I mean, mm-hmm. recently we had TV Joshua in Nigeria. So I think it's, well, it's, a, it's an exaggerated story because it benefited a few. Yeah. But it's, it's unique in, in, in its own way and true. But I don't think he was the only one and will be the only one. Mm-hmm. You know, there will be people with special talents even in our future. And there will always be people who don't believe them. Yes. But I know it's fake, it's a yes, lie, it's yes. like, he's a you know, devil. He's... And, you know, 
let's simplify this whole thing here, faith, and just say that everything you believe works. Mm. You know, because if, yeah. if you look at the process, you as an educated person, it doesn't make sense to you. Mm. But they, they'll deal with you. Bro. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> they'll deal with you, bro. They'll deal with you, with your education, you know. <laughs> They're like, oh, no, this one does not know it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. It, yeah. it works according to faith, because even Jesus used to say to everyone, your faith has made you hold. Yeah. yeah. So it's what you believe. I think whatever you believe happens to you, affects you. Absolutely. You know, because yeah. also having been exposed to this political space, these guys do a lot, man, you know. Mm. And some of them would go as far as come up to your face and say, shit, man, what are you on? Because we've tried. Yeah, as you a know? cone. As a cone. But yes. whatever works on you is what you believe in, what you accept. Absolutely. Yeah. So now you, you moved away from the production of music production of of uh, music videos um uh, where where was your next move look i didn't actually move away from the production of music videos the industry okay. ran out of money oh yeah we got into the 2008 recession so here's what happened oh. so 2006 7 i'm working through palomino we had a client called peach mobile Hmm. The guys that oh. used to do content for distribution on mobile. Like, madam, madam, you're being told. Oh, yeah. So, we used to do all that content for those guys, right? Yes. So, I then approached the record labels. I said to the record labels, look, the future of music distribution is on mobile. Hmm. There was no iTunes in 2006, 7, 8. Yes. So, I'm talking shit, basically. So they don't believe you? No. Because they look at a phone and they're like, how can it possibly no be? No believe me. At Except the time. for one guy called <laughs> Melvin Kumalo. He's late now. Yeah. Melvin Kumalo used to run Kelo. Okay. So Melvin is the only record company exec. There was a hot man here in, called Orak at EMI. Orak thought I was nuts. But Tui Tui didn't even give me the time of day. I mean, no one wanted to listen. Okay, Arthur always listens, but Arthur will be critical because he's, he's a very strong businessman, you know? Yeah. Because I remember there was a time, you know, because I didn't know how this digital thing would, would roll out. So yeah. I assumed it would go through web, you know? Okay. So, because that's how Prince Michael had distributed his first digital project. It was uh, George Michael, was it? George, George Michael, Michael, yeah. No, I think it was George Michael or Prince, between the two, George or Prince, they okay. did their first digital distribution through the web, so you could download the album. So then, I go to these record labels, I'm like, the future is digital, they're like, this one is nuts, he just wants business from us. I tell Arthur, I remember selling Arthur a website, because I thought it would come through web, you know? Hmm. Hey, Arthur is a good crowd man because, you know, I was a lighty and he just listened to me every time. Listen, listen. Okay, sharp, Jimmy. Phone me next week. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll think about it. So one time he says to me, but Jimmy, what am I going to do with the website? And this was somewhere around 2008, eight nine. Just. And Internet I, was new. Yeah. yeah. And I couldn't answer him. You know, I was like, Ish. yeah, yeah. All right. I'll come back to you. Now, remember, there was Facebook was there, but it wasn't as prevalent. Yeah. It wasn't as effective. It could only take text. Yeah. You know? Mm. Twitter only came into play in 2012. Mm. There was no Instagram. It's true. So, basically, I couldn't answer him and tell him that Yo, your website will get traction by being on social media. And I couldn't answer him. There was no way I could get traffic to his website. Mm. And the fact that I wanted so much money for it also, he said, no, but with that money, I can make a million. So convince me. And I couldn't, you see. Mm. But and websites were not cheap then? No, 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 not at all. Mm. So this hot man called Melvin Kumano, who used to rent Kylo, heard me. I don't know whether it was because he was, he had, he was well-traveled or educated, but he heard me. So Melvin then brought the whole thing catalog a galo for us to digitize mm. right so remember i said we used to do content for for peach mobile so i had a guy in the studio there called dom dom from soweto the guy that did 985 and so i had dom there mm. in the studio 
domed and digitized. Actually, basically, we did. There were no true tones at the time, so we did MIDI, oh. MIDI tones, and yeah. monotones. So it was sound. Woo, 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 woo. So oh, you had to make out that this is the song they're trying to. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Dome did all of that. So so Melvin believed. So 2008, the Global Recession hits the record companies and already they were struggling with album sales because they were so ridiculous. Yeah. So one of the things that Zola always complained about, which is the price of the CD, said it's out of reach for my market. Mm. They cannot afford this. Mm. Instead of spending 70 rand on a CD, they'd rather spend 70 rand on a T-shirt. You know, so the industry was really hit hard. Mm. Um, because of that, they did not evolve, you know? Mm. And... Here's what also happened after that. Melvin then left Gallo and Melvin went and signed a few Bakana artists, Oshui and Omteka and and all of those guys, right? Mm. Then I, I linked up Melvin with, with David, who owned Peach Mobile at the time, because remember, Peach Mobile could distribute sound on the phone, those true tones and what, what. And Melvin brought them things and all of those things and you will not believe that in 2009 Melvin was collecting on average about 50,000 a week what? from distributing that in Bacana digitally what? so now the guys that did not evolve what do you think happened to them? obviously died out all got robbed they, went, they all now had to rush to the other guys, what was the other guys that were distributing music as well? They ended up, the, the mobile companies also. Mm. So a lot of them, I mean, ended up getting very bad deals with those the mobile distributors because everyone now has tried to, you know. So... Is they, it the ones where SMS, yes. whatever, then you get a... Yeah. And then that time you, you're another in guy, a contract. Another guy who understood it is a guy I think called Zolani or something. He owns a group, a Kasi. I saw him recently in a music video. Uh, I remember the name of the group. He also got it because he used to bring his music to David to distribute and even Lance didn't understand it. Mm. I just forget what it's called. It's, it's, I remember the group, you know? So yeah. he also got it, you know? But the industry died because of that. Oh, it killed the sales of because also the thing is we already had a problem with copyright where the CDs were concerned mm. so now imagine when you can release a single track okay you understand what I mean yeah, yeah. so like the industry struggled because it couldn't evolve the likes of Gallo closed EMI closed because it was not worth it And but the premise of this record label was never actually to push local talent they were established yeah. here to have a base for the international artists. To distribute. So if that wasn't working, then there was no reason for them to keep their doors open. Mm. So that's, that's, that was the natural progression. So I had to progress from, you know, I had to look at other avenues because the music videos were not being done anymore. The record labels were reluctant to release albums, mm. so then I, we had to look at other avenues. But even and music piracy also. Music piracy, but music piracy was never such a big issue because the piracy was actually done by the labels themselves. Oh, you know, so the piracy was never really a problem. Oh, you know, because yeah. Sure. All right. So then, uh, <clears throat> what was your next move? So like I told you, so it's 2009, I get a call from my mom. She's excited that the deputy president is the premier. Oh, yes. And I had a lot of considerations to make because remember, I built a business here. But naturally, I knew because of understanding web and social media that the world was evolving and changing towards online presence. Okay. So as part of my plan since 2005, five six, I always knew that I would focus mostly on online and web around 2010. But I didn't know why mm. but or how. Or yeah. how you yeah. know? So when that happened and, you know, the record labels no longer had money and everything was a bit funny, I then decided to focus on communication because already I had started doing that 2008 with 
working with clients like Peach Mobile mm. and also PC Trading and Business College. They used to do more, all of their adverts. So I, I was already in marketing and communication by virtue of those clients. So mm. it was a natural progression to move towards communication. Mm. And what a lot of people misunderstand is that marketing and communication are two totally different animals. Mm. Same way PR and marketing are two totally different yeah. animals, you know. But people want to club them all together. Yeah, it seems easy, but it just complicates things. Mm. So um, I was doing marketing. Because also it included media buying and all of that stuff for the likes of PC training and business college. Mm. But then I appreciated communication more, mm. you know. So the progression naturally was towards communications. So in 2009, I then started looking at um, what where is communication moving towards, and I identified opportunities and I focused more on that space so communication going forward because also I had as a business as a business okay. because now we we had also uh, I'll, I'll, call, I'll call them support structures mm. you know I always say to clients that you know social media is a convergence point mm. you know um, it's it's where you find everyone yeah. I call it a bus stop yeah. I say this because I, I like I told you with the story Sky Art I struggled to sell artists websites and, and other things where digital content is concerned because they would ask me just the basics like where who's gonna see this thing, you know? Those type of things, you know. And it was new. It was new. I couldn't answer. Yeah. But now with social media then you can confidently say hey, there are thirteen million people on Facebook. So they're bound to see your stuff however way, you yeah. know. So yeah, we moved into into communication because of the support structures that came into play. And, and then we also identified opportunities within that space. We, we appreciate more working with organizations than individuals. Mm. So we then identified organizations within the communication space that needed assistance, you know. Mm. And we'd approach them and do business with them. So the progression was natural also because of the support systems that they, they'd been put in place right because now remember i'm a producer so i produce audio visuals so and then i do voice audio um then we do graphics uh, visual presentation so what then facebook did is it allowed us to have a platform where we could showcase all of that mm without breaking the bank yeah. you know so it was a natural progression for me because oftentimes i do the ads for the art for the client and then have a problem with placing them mm. because you know sapc would be so expensive and so on and so forth you know so mm. when when facebook came in more importantly facebook you know when facebook came into the space it really made things easy for us mm. you know because it opened up it opened up the space mm. because now we could do the audio visual for the client and then say let's put it here we could target the reach you know for sure so we naturally progressed towards that after after 20 let's say 2010 fully right. yeah. do you think people still don't understand social media and the reach and impact of social media i i think we we still haven't explored the possibilities mm. because remember these are babies man i remember one time i was in cape town and we were getting lost so we put on we decided to use google to navigate and one of the guys i was with uh, says ah, joe are you really going to trust an 18 year old uh, yeah 18 year old with our lives and i was like yeah it's our reality now yeah you know yeah so I think these platforms are new. They're still developing. Like mm. I, I'd say when I started with Facebook, it wasn't what it is now. Mm. You mm. know, mm. Uh, at the present moment, it's it's a masterpiece. But when it started out, you know, I also struggled with a lot of clients who felt like we were just hogwashing them, you know, because yeah. this, I had to tell one client, no, no, this, this, this is all new. You know, we are mm. all learning as we go along. So... I do think people don't understand Facebook or mm. social media, and it's just natural. Mm. You know, it's a it's a new platform that is still trying to figure itself out as well. You know? I was actually watching this guy. He's a he's a digital media expert. So 
you were saying something similar to what you were saying, Pore. When he started off, everyone thought he was crazy mm. on Facebook. Then when YouTube came on, he put his own first video and he thought, everybody thought, All right, it's like, what the hell are you doing? Like, Here's a story about YouTube. Yeah. 2006, seven, I'm doing videos for Cleo. For DJ Cleo, yeah? yeah. But DJ Cleo is funny. Yeah. No, he's really funny. He's, you know? Yeah, he's a character. He's a character. Yeah. He's, he's really funny. So, in between shooting those videos, we're at his house. I tell the boys, let's do a, a behind the scenes. You know? Hmm. We start shooting this thing. I'm calling it the Scalini Sessions. Okay. He's in studio, various artists, you know? So, now obviously, the thing has to have money at some point, you know? Hmm. So Cleo has always been independent of Lance. He's Cleo is a businessman who did his business right. That's why he's still standing, and I have no doubt he'll stand forever. Mm. So I say, Lance, there's Cleo here. We're doing. Says, go speak to him. That one, go speak to him. <laughs> you know, I'm not getting involved. I wanted Lance to pay for it, so I go speak to Cleo. Cleo listens. He got it. He got it. He just doesn't like parting with money. Yeah. But the, the really fascinating part for us was when I say to Cleo, so we've explored all options, okay, we're not going to SAPC for distribution. Uh, where is this thing going to play to? And I like, I'm saying, I say to him, YouTube. Hmm. I lost Cleo in that meeting, bruh. What? He looked at me like I was nuts. Yes. I walked out of that meeting. When Melvin, I remember, <laughs> I lost him in that meeting. In hindsight, had he listened to me, do you know he'd be the biggest YouTube artist, the biggest artist in Africa on YouTube? Because when I was saying let's do reality shows, there were no reality shows. The first reality show to hit TV, hit TV in 2010, bruh, was the Kardashians. <sighs> and you had all this content. Wait, and... can, you, can you imagine? Like mm. how big of a brand he would be. Mm. Mm. And this guy was saying, like, for instance, with uh, all these social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, everybody kept on asking him more. What are you thinking? What are you now he's talking he was talking about TikTok three, four years ago. And then people were saying, no, it's just a bunch of kids, 11-year-olds, 14-year-olds. Let me tell you a story. <laughs> so obviously, I go, this communication takes me into politics. Yeah. So the president starts his campaign in 2016. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On Facebook. I go tell the, the, the acting chairperson of the province in Pumalanga, he's currently the chairperson now. Yeah. Like Comrade Mandla. Comrade Cyril is campaigning. He says to me, ah, it's Facebook. <laughs> it's nothing. Yeah. Facebook has sentiment analysis, bro. Facebook, uh, those are real people. Well, those are yeah. not fictitious characters there. Those you get direct are, feedback. Yes. You it, can measure. It. You can measure growth. You can yeah. measure results, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And plus, there are 13 million people there that are at yeah. your disposal. I'm only talking South Africa. If not more than that. It's yeah. 13 million according to the recent stats. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. Twitter only has 3 million a month. What? 3.5 or something, you know? Yeah. So, it's, you know, if you f fully understand what the platform is, yeah. then you will understand its its its, its, it's effective, impact. It's, it's impact, yeah. So I, I, I got to study, uh, there was a doctor, he's actually a German guy, he's a doctor, he wrote a book about Obama. So he gave me the book, I met with a guy here through some other white lady. I studied Obama's first campaign, studied it, and I saw how he was using Facebook. Sentiment analysis. And I came and I was telling comrades about it. 2014, 2015, and I'm trying to say the biggest users of Facebook are in Joburg. Bro, it's a good thing you don't smoke weed because they just would have thought Manjo in Tango, no? I said to them, <laughs> 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 I 
he's on to something <laughs> crazy. Even they touch you. <laughs> They're like, and I, and I, I, I and I tried to show them, and I even said we can even segmentize. Yes, your reach. Your reach. You're gonna target women. You're gonna target men. You're gonna target black men, white but men. You're gonna target Bedford View. You can do it, and it's cheaper than going to put an mm. advert go newspaper. Mm. Put an advert on radio. Put an advert on TV. Gary, give me all that budget and let me use it on social oh, media. they thought you wanted to get rich. Yeah, no, they thought so. And they didn't want to. And they thought, ah, this one is crazy. And look now. You know... Look now. Same thing. We were fortunate enough that... And I'm not just blowing his horn, Julia. Yeah. Like, Didi is really smart. Yeah. Didi got it. Remember, I was telling you the story about the MEC I had a problem with, yeah. with social media. They didn't get it, but he got it, you yeah. know. And I, and he fully, 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 fully supported it, you know. Yeah. So, like, um, where that is concerned, man, I just think that the comrades are lacking because of lack of reach mm. and exposure. We we partnered with the Telco Data Mining Company recently. Mm. They've got an amazing product which allows for sentiment analysis and mobilization. They're struggling to roll it out in other African countries. More importantly, we're struggling here. I mean, we've brought it even to the attention of the presidency. Because what our system does is that it allows you to gauge sentiment analysis in real time and in in foresight, right? So we can tell from what people are engaging or feeling about a particular issue Mm. at the present moment how they're most likely to react to it in two or three months time yeah you know and you can build a strategy to avert that you know like with our sentiment analysis not to blow our horns but we could have averted the july unrest because it was prevalent it was in, clear. In, in analytics that mm. people are, are, are getting angry, people mm. are getting agitated. We just didn't know what was going to trigger them. Mm. You know what mm. I mean? Yeah. Mm. Um, so we've, we've managed to make a breakthrough in Nigeria. And I was saying to my partners that the only reason we've managed to make a breakthrough in Nigeria is because those guys studied in England. Mm. So they were mm. exposed to first world systems. We're struggling here, bro. They don't get it. You know, they don't get it. And and you like, you know what, Neb? This this tool, even just the social media itself, used effectively, mm-hmm. we wouldn't have service delivery issues. We wouldn't. You know, because we people wouldn't. complain because they don't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. And a whole host of things we would be able to prevent and avert if we were communicating adequately, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And this platform like you adequately it discovered back then has made it easy for us to you know to 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 reach those objectives so mm. i was getting back to this guy being smart right mm. they were smart enough because i said to him well, you can't walk into people's houses anymore no you one don't. people i mean one day makali man eh, mm. has been saying i don't know for the longest time that the urbanization is making us lose members because we're struggling to reach them. So why aren't we using conventional means to get to them? Because one, we live in security states. True. You can't just come there and leave a pamphlet for me. Mm. You understand what mm. I mean? Yeah. But we all have cell phones. We're all on Facebook. I mean, even a suggestion that send them messages there. Yeah. You know, the crazy thing was that the the, the ANC in Joburg, I was actually telling the story yesterday that they sent me to London to go and study the Labour Party. I remember. Party. <laughs> you remember you told me that. Yo, dog. We come back here with best practices. And best say, practices. <laughs> they're like, uh, I'm saying to them, who still goes with a street sheet mm. in a suburbia? Look for the tile, I mean, because well, it's trespassing. Yeah, that's <laughs> you, you can't just walk into my yard. You can't go to gated communities, high walls, mm. and you want to use a street sheet. And then on top of that, that street sheet, you don't know if it's a 9 or an 8 or a 6. And and then when you come back, those issues that are contained on your street sheet, they Not stay addressed. in a the branch. They don't make it to the region. And I remember the one time we got a hold of, we started asking branches, no, Kisang, all the street sheets, we start compiling them. We're like, okay, here's transport issues, here's economic issues. 
here's uh, unemployment issues, here's what, what, what. Where now you're the MMC of transport, MMC of housing, MMC of this, resolve the issues as per how they were raised. And they were not attended to. You know, I've always said that the time we had enough constituency offices as the ANC before the money issue, mm. that where there's a constituency office, there shouldn't be service delivery issues. Uh -huh. And I think, you know, you know, we can get sidetracked with this because we're passionate about it. Yeah. But the long and short of it, we seriously don't have a resource issue. We have a capacity issue. Mm. So we're deploying inadequately. I was saying to these other guys that I met in Kimberley, comrades, I had a PGC in Lapa. Yeah. So I had an opportunity to engage with comrades, you know. And I I sort of, I, I feel bad, Mina, because I wasn't part of SASCO mm. or COSAS. Yeah. You know. <laughs> we don't have those, those credentials. credentials. Yeah. And, uh -huh. and, and sh forget the credentials. If we had been part of those groups or formations, we would have actually had a meaningful impact. I was saying to this other comrade that it's our fault that we allowed these imbeciles to run this thing for such a long time. Mm -hmm. We have two options now. We can either reclaim it or run away from it like cowards. Mm -hmm. But the best option is to reclaim it mm -hmm. because it's our fault. If we had participated in student movements, we would be the MECs right now. But instead, there are these idiots there which we are complaining about because we did not participate. Mm -hmm. When good men do nothing, mm. you you allow Ripari to take over and, and, and run us. And, and and at that time, you can see there's no capacity there None at whatsoever. all. None at all. You can't have an MEC worried about Facebook mm. when the department is in shambles. Mm. Do you understand what I mean? Like, what are you concerned about? What are you, you know? Mm. So I want to ask you, <clears throat> so you helped the ANC in, in, in Pumalanga to establish the online platforms. You went as far as to create a, a, call a call center as well. The purpose of creating a call center was for people to be able to report issues directly. Here's why we created the call center. So the then DP at the time says to me, help us with communication. And I didn't even understand what he was talking about. Mm. So I had to go and apply myself now. What do I need? What can I do for the organization? And then I realized that there is some form of detachment between the ANC and the people. Yeah. You know? And I found that the people appreciate it when they find that engagement. That's why they always take our T-shirts. You know, they take whatever we give them. You'll be driving around in ANC Regalia, hey, comrade, comrade. Then they come and they speak to you about their problems because they assume that you are close to leadership, mm -hmm. you know? So I said to DP, look, I need to set up a call center because we need to bridge that link between the ANC and the people. Mm -hmm. And this was in 2014 when you came back from London. Mm -hmm. And he got it, which was surprising for me. He got everything. You know, mm. even went as far as asking me, Where do you want us to work? I was like, No, man, I run my own business. You know, mm. I run from my office. Well, what do you? He's like, No, I'm thinking you should be here. <laughs> yeah, so, set it up here. So he got it, you know, mm. and that was why we eventually set up that call center because, you know, we, we needed to bridge the gap between the public and the ANC. And, mm. you know, from reports I got from that when we launched it eventually. People really appreciated receiving that phone call, you know, uh, even non-ANC members, because we would even have access to, to just normal people, white people who are not ANC members, who would appreciate the fact that we phoned and, you know, would end up telling us what we did not know, mm. you know. Mm. So the, the whole idea behind that call center was not only just for, for calling purposes, but it was a data center. Because mm. remember now, we had started all these social media platforms and people are engaging them so we needed a platform where we could fully engage and respond to issues mm. because during that tenure then I got exposed to the constituency offices hence I will say to you we shouldn't have a service delivery protest in any mm. town 
or what if there's a, a constituency office that is effective that is effective mm. you know mm. so it was basically to bridge that gap and get effective communication between the organization its members and the members of the public mm. Mm. so where where do you think we went wrong as a movement bigotism okay explain that it's this thing of entitlement yeah you know, um, I think a spirit of bigotism came into play in the organization where people felt they deserved certain positions by virtue of being available for the ANC for the longest time, you name it, you know. Mm. I was in exile, was, yeah, blah, so, blah, blah. So we, breed, we, we began to breed a lot of bigots, mm. which are in very high positions at the moment. Like, there's no reason why the ANC should be owing service providers after every election. Mm. Mm. There's enough money. And it's one of the... It's actually the only biggest party that leaves an election with debt. It's because of bigotism. Mm. You know? Selfishness. Bigotism is the highest form of selfishness. I think that's where it went wrong. And I, I have to put it out there that there's nothing wrong with the ANC. There's nothing wrong with the ANC. It's the people within the organization which have a problem. Mm. And that those this, that's not a big issue also. That's why I could never leave the ANC because it's not the issue. And the people that are an issue, they die, they yeah. leave. Uh -huh. So it shouldn't be a factor, mm. you know. So I think that's where it went wrong. Bigotism, you know, mm. self and personal entitlement mm -hmm. from various leaders and people in positions of power. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not your man, it's the department's man, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So I think bigotism is, is the problem here. Mm -hmm. And if we can read the bigots, which I think, you know, is what the organization is trying to do, read the bigots, then, you know, you will have something... Is it possible? It is possible. Is it not too deep no we're it's not just, in too it, deep it's just it's just we have to arrest people that's just that you know it's because when you become a bigot you become clumsy but think about it if if NEC and at least let's say an estimate of about 60% of them are embroiled in some corruption of the other 60%. Then it, it could be high. It gives room for us to occupy those positions. Do you think they'll allow it, though? It's what I'm asking. Like they will... that, That's why Vele, we've, we've implemented the step-aside rule, because people will not allow it, you know? Mm. People don't want to let go of power. Like, you ask yourself, this minister has been minister since Mandela, Joe. Mm. Why, why, why aren't you giving other kids a chance? Mm. You're not going to lose anything. Your packages, everything is all tall. They say politics is the only one that people don't retire from. They have to get fired. They have to get fired or die. Yes, that's right. Eventually, we'll get it right once those bigots are gone. Because retirement is 65. Mm. So in a workplace... You should we, be gone by then. You should be gone. Mm. But it's only in politics, in parliament... You'll find a 90-year-old. Yeah. Your councils, you see where these people are tired. Care mm. council, but you say, walk from here today just to <laughs> monitor the streets. <laughs> they can't do it. Hey, it's, it's <laughs> difficult, man, the things we see. Things we see. And we love this movement, though. Like, you know, I was, I was actually frustrated. I think it's been the last two weeks. Just my frustration to think... And like, Owar Tambo warned us against these things. Mm. Utata Nelson Mandela warned us against these things. Like, be careful of what you are going to the become. The wage drivers. The wage drivers. Be careful of, wait until, if you think waging a struggle uh, against the liberation, it's difficult. Wait until you're in power. Mm. You know, you then realize how difficult it's going to be to, to stay in power. Yes. And if you look at the history of liberation movements, they're only in power for 20 years, 25 if they are lucky. And then you look at, you look at the trend of where liberation movements lose power. They lose power in the inner city centers. 
your Gauteng, your metropolitan centers, because there people read, people know, people are aware, and then you become a rural party, and then and then slowly gravitate towards more and more losses. Becoming irrelevant. You know, and, and it's worrying because you sit and you wait and you watch. And somebody said to me the other day, I'm waiting for ANC, it's like, you know when you love this chick and she doesn't like you? <laughs> 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 Baby, where are you? We actually have a lovely relationship with the ANC. <laughs> That's why whenever I speak of it, I always say it's the most difficult relationship to have. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you generally have to love it, you know, to, to, yeah. to stay here. And you're like, baby, I can't hear you. I can't hear like, but I'm done, I'm not sure. But you know what she's up to. That's the ANC. <laughs> to be a guy, baby, I won't take uh, a good mind. That's, I can't go to the next. I'm not told by any baby. That time, you know, baby, I'm propelling. She gives you stories and you accept it. <laughs> That's us. <awesome. laughs> Yo. My brother, so where to from here for you, brother? What are you What are you up to now? What are you busy with? What are the latest projects with you uh, as um, we wrap it up? I'm I'm busy with with movies at the moment. Yeah, uh, I actually never thought I'd do movies, but um, I was shocked when I saw that on your Facebook, as you were saying. Get out. Yeah, no, um, I, you know, we 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 fell into our first one, which was just by luck. Um, Is it the like, one you told me about? Yeah. Or you showed me? Yeah. Yes, yes. yeah. I don't like calling things lucky, but um, so my younger brother came to work for us at Palomino and at a young age, and um, he developed a skill as a line producer. So a line producer is the guy that manages the whole entire set, basically the guy that takes all the headaches. You know? Yeah. It's, it's a job mostly done by women, but he does it very well. Has nothing to do with his sexuality, though. Yeah. But he does it very well. <laughs> <laughs> Just how you have to explain it. <laughs> My mind was not even there. <laughs> now it is. <laughs> <laughs> I have to put it out there. <laughs> so now it's such a brilliant line producer that then when that international movie came last year, Collusion, oh, okay. um, he was the best person who could actually put it off at the time that was required yeah you know so we did that movie we did very well it's a Netflix movie that got released on the 16th of June to coincide with June 16 mm. it's a movie that speaks to a whole host of issues like xenophobia it speaks to the issue of human trafficking drugs racism all issues that are relevant to the South African market and its issues yeah so we got to work with an international director, Fabian Modele, and you know we managed to even get like one of the dopest DOPs at the present moment, uh, Offense Mwase, onto that film. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that nigga is onto something else. He's brilliant, man, and um, he's really brilliant. We've been fortunate to work with him on a couple of projects even prior to 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 him being this big you know yeah so we we did that and which has led us to other things now where we are working on the next movie which we're going to be shooting in Kimberley hmm. and and yeah that, that's that's the next phase for us you know yeah and it's it's motivated by when COVID started the Altea Muzak Dakile phoned me said they brew am you he phone phones and says I'll tell you I'll tell you know so it's a ganja you know and I was like Kangaza that nigga's still around man that nigga's here somewhere ah. I need to find him <laughs> Zach Tagil Zach the godfather of TV yeah, yeah. and radio and radio and radio Sheesh. that yeah. my G gave so many people a chance man that guy was I remember like when a we stepping started, stone for when, many bro when we started working with Boy D I couldn't understand until Boy D you know what I mean? Oh, what's Boiti? Yeah, I mean, Boiti was given a chance by Zach. What? On some show called Media Career Guide. He also gave Tibo Touch a platform. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and he took his job. <laughs> <laughs> but he's not personal about that. Yeah. He, he, it's, it's water under the bridge. So Zach says to me, 
he grew up so when and so I get stuck now. I mean, he says that he grew up. People are, are, are at home. What are they doing at home? And I was like uh, watching TV. I was like, that's what we need to focus our energies. Shit. Content creation. Yeah. The, they were saying content creation is the next goal. Content, you know, the next goal is data. Mm. But that's a discussion for another day. Yeah. But the, the real black gold now is data. Because, you know, it's gotten so busy because of social media also that you need to know your client the way you know yourself. Mm. You know, so you need to get to a point where I was sitting with a friend, she sells gas. You're right, actually. And she says that um, she can preempt when her clients are going to need their next gas cylinders because she has mastered usage. So she's able to phone them and say, hey, your gas is running out in two weeks. Order some gas. Oh. And valley in two weeks, they'd run out of gas. So that is the future of marketing and communication because mm. you need to know your client as well as you know yourself. You need to preempt to mm. say, and be able to sell them a bed and start, you know. So, yeah, data. Data is the next gold. Content yeah. is king, you know, because at every point people want to be entertained. But data is the new gold, you know. And and you can already see how Facebook is like the king at it. Yeah. Google, mm. all these other because we go to their platforms and, and we, we express them. ourselves. And we give it to them for free. And you know when I discovered how Google became so smart, uh. we told Google everything it knows. Yeah. We travel a lot, you know, for campaigns and what what. There would be instances where we'd be driving using Google Maps, and Google would say there's no road, and we're on a road. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. So you know what then happens afterwards? Google then captures that a road is here because oh. you passed through here. Yeah. There were many times during campaigns <laughs> in Bush Park Ridge with then Chaperson and everywhere where we would say, we just told Google. We just told Google. <laughs> because to us, it would go and go and go and then say, you're in a field now. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. So we fed them all of that data, everything they know about our townships, our language, everything. We fed them, and and uh, it's interesting because <clears throat> I was watching this thing quickly. Jorge, Silicon Valley, mm-hmm. just those white boys there. What they've done, because Silicon Valley, it's your Google, it's your YouTube. It's it's like incredible. Mm. Just how they they also you know. The government also supported tech mm. to a level where they created all these platforms that we now use. And whereas with us, South Africa, we don't have a Google, we don't have we don't have anything of ours, we don't have a Facebook. But we, we don't, don't need a... we don't need that. We need to regulate what is there. Mm. Even there was a time there was this whole thing, a copyright act, which was at play. And dog, I studied copyright, you know. Yeah. So I would try to advise comrades and comrades, do it this way, you know. And comrades just didn't want to listen, you know. Mm. So we don't need a Facebook. We need we need uh, to regulate a Facebook okay. in this country. Yeah. The same way that they've done in Europe, you yeah. know. We should have taken note when Europe was complaining about the privacy breach and took Mark Zuckerberg to court. We should have done the same. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. So that. That, that's what we need right now because look, uh, there are many reasons why Facebook was established and one which is prevalent is that the CIA just needed to be able to spy on everyone mm. you know, mm. I don't know how true that is but it looks very feasible mm. looking at what the platform can do I don't know, know eh, because look at I mean America, school shooting like shit happens underneath their but watch they're, anyway. not, they're more social media networks that side and they're not using this platform as much as we are 9-11 happened other than knows the but, shootings have happened but the, like, nine, the, the Facebook came after 9-11 oh because okay. it was established in 2004 exactly for because it's a data capturing company in essence yeah, I don't know if CIA is doing a good job anyway, bro. <laughs> <laughs> the mass murders that have happened under there, bro, it's like People buy guns and then they don't know that so and so bought like automatic rifles. 
it's their gun laws that are letting them down. Yeah, and yeah. Exposure and access, you know. But like, that's a conversation for another day. Yeah. Yeah, but also it, it leads us back to content, ne? Yeah. Um, people become what they consume. Yeah. If you remember Yizo Yizo, what it did to children at school. It did. So the American story can also be blamed on the content that their people are exposed to. Mm. You know, mm. and what they are feeding their nation. Yeah. You can't make it easy to buy a gun and expect people not to shoot one another. No, you can't. So yeah. But anyways, we'll we'll catch up on their stories one day. <laughs> We've got enough of our own. We've got yeah. these counselors. We enough. Need to with. Enough. Just your last parting words, brother. As a businessman, as a as a family man, you. We didn't even touch on this because we had so much to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> you're a dad. You're a family man. You're a husband. You're a businessman. You're a politician. <laughs> you're a communicator. I'm, I'm always reminded by this comrades that I'm not a politician. <laughs> They're like that. <laughs> Whether you are the administrator, <laughs> not a politician, stay away from political issues. Is it, is it is it is it difficult to manage as a man, like to balance? For, and how do you do it? No, for me, I always try to get involved with things that I love. I never do anything I don't like or I don't love. Okay. So everything has to interlink. So I don't like feeling like I'm working. Okay. So everything has to interlink and it has to be part of the fun. Yeah. You know, so it never feels or gets to a point where I feel like it's overwhelming because I enjoy everything. Mm -hmm. So whether I'm communicating and creating content, it's part of what I enjoy, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, or or whether I'm doing a film or I'm doing music or whatever. This, This just, there has to be that element of of my passion being in there, you know. <laughs> so same way, it never feels like strainers for me because I always have enough time, you know, for almost everything because it, it never takes its toll. So I never get home, like, I'm too exhausted to chill with the kids. Oh, well, it does happen that I get tired, but mm. still, it, it never feels like, you know, mm. it's mm. work. I have to... Going home now, I have to sit with the kids, and tomorrow I have to wake up and go. You know, it's, it never feels that way. You know? It's mm. just like a flow, a flow of, of things. You know? So, mm. I, I don't think I have any wise words for balance except to say let's try to get involved with things we love and are passionate about because then it never feels like work. Yeah, know? yeah. How many kids you got? Three. Sure. Yeah. You're done, brother. Did you throw the keys away or you still? Uh, <laughs> I'm looking for twins now. What? Yeah, I just, you want to have five kids, dog. And you know what they say about <laughs> a lot of kids and poor people. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thinking about it, but you know the thing is, in my in my in my family, uh, my bloodline, there isn't a lot of us. You know. Okay. Like, I'm sure you haven't come across a lot of Abubaloi. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That's why every time we see one another, we assume we're related somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um. I just want to do that for the sake of, you know, um, keeping the family legacy going. I'm yeah. hoping there'll be boys, because okay. another thing, we get a lot of girls, you know. Okay, so you got three girls. No, I've got two girls and a boy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah, so, but I'm thinking about it, because also, Joe, hey, it's so expensive to have kids, and at some point I want to retire, you know. Yeah. And kids need you there. Um, I was actually talking to another guy about it to say if you have a child today, by the time the child turns 16, you would have spent more than 2.5 million. Mm. And how old would you be? Because I'm 38. So if I'm having a child now, by the time they turn 16, I'll be 60. Yeah, if you have them now, it's uh, so at it's least about 60, 63, 64. It's not feasible, eh? No. Now I was actually telling my kids, I said, you know what, I can't wait until you guys are out the house, yo. It's a song to prove. I'm like, yo, man. I tell them all the time, man. Like, I've set, like, a timeline even. 21, I need everyone out of here. You turn 21, go find yourself. I said to them, I told my daughter, in fact, I wanted her to travel more. Mm. I said, 
Go work on the ships. Go work in the US. Go au pair. Go see the world. Because by the time... And I said to them, I don't want you to make the same mistakes I've done. Where at 23, 24, you settle down. You have a family. And then you, don't, you never get to see the world. Mm. Or it costs you more to travel. Now you've got three or four kids to try and go to London. So what we've been trying to tell my wife's sister's daughter who rushed into marriage at the age of 21. Yeah. So, you know, I take your time, you know, see the world, go. enjoy your money, mm. you know, because, you know, I, I had to build a family because the first child was there mm. and I wanted all my kids with one woman. Mm. So I had to build a family. But yeah. if I had given, had been given enough time to plan for it, I would have planned for it much better yeah. and maybe put it off for a later time. Me too. You know? Me too. I could have waited until I was 40 before I had a child. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been the best move ever. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I was thinking, I'm, I'm 28, <laughs> but yeah, that's where we are. You know? <laughs> I'm like, no, but I don't regret anything. No. I'm no. just saying. <laughs> no regrets at all, but then you could have had a bit of time to plan. Yeah, you know, could have done a lot of things better. You know, could have saved a lot more. Yeah, could have, could have done a lot more. Yeah, that's yeah. my biggest qualms, the saving. Yeah, yeah, could have. Because <laughs> now it's like creepy. pockets yeah. have holes, dog. I could be sitting pretty right now. Yeah, you know, if I had enough time. Yo, my brother, you have been such an amazing guest, man. Thank, Thank you so you. much for sharing your story. And for sharing your life and just being a genuine guy, man. You know how difficult it is to find <laughs> genuine niggas, man. Like, like you know, because, you know, you know, guys, man. We're, like, so bottled up in egos, bottled up in I'm the man, bottled up in titles, bottled up in, you know, things that we think we accumulate. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, your true authenticity is what is in, inside of you, mm -hmm. you know, and... Uh, keep being so genuine man you Thank know you, man. and uh, it's hard to find rare real people um you know and uh may god bless you in everything and i know you put him first in all that you do i do i do i do i always tell my my friends and associates that there's two ways you can live life you can live life where you think you know yeah or you can live life where you put everything on god and it makes it a bit easier because mm -hmm. then you don't have to make all the decisions and also you don't have to take all the blame you know yeah so yeah. can say god told me this yeah <laughs> god told me <laughs> and they're like yeah okay we get it it's not your fault just, just, just one work in court but <laughs> you can try <laughs> so yeah man i just have to do that also for my sanity yeah, yeah. Yeah, because, Absolutely. Yeah, but uh, thank you so much. Man. No, it's been awesome, man. You and thank I can you. chat the whole day, man. We should do a five-hour podcast. We should know? do a five-hour podcast. Very <laughs> 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 like, because you know, I always think, and I think it's the reason why I created this podcast mm -hmm. because I knew Jorge at times. Because you know, I love mentoring young people, yes, 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 yes. teaching, sharing knowledge, and I found that you can't be with everyone at the same time. Yeah. So if we do a session like this. There's a nigga out there who's going to be sitting and looking and say, Antlek Le Khrotman Le Naman said something, you know? Antlek Le Khrotman Le has shared something with me. And, and, and that's why I found that to do a podcast like this, it allows for us to be able to share ideas and teach guys who come after us. Because yeah. you and I know, brother, not many guys our age group could sit with us and teach us and say, Ndwana, wait for a little bit. Don't rush into this family thing. Mm. Don't make this mistake when you buy your first house. Mm. Don't make a mistake buying cars, mm. impressing cars. chicks, you know. And, and, and if you think about how many mistakes we've made, if we had a Makhrut Mani who could teach us, we would not have made as many mistakes as we have. You know, like there's a line in one of these old albums I got to do. So he says, you know, my, when my younger brother comes to you, mm. Uh, he's not asking you for money. He just wants exposure. Show him. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So the, this is highly appreciated because someone gets to see something, learn something which under normal circumstances they wouldn't have. Absolutely. You know? 
because all that a Kasi child needs, man, is exposure. Yeah. I was saying to the guys in Kimberley, you know, once they see, they'll do it themselves. True. So, our duty, you know, when God blesses us, God has blessed you with such a nice platform, um, it's to expose the possibilities mm. and inspire the hood, you mm. know. That's, that's all we can offer now. Yeah, you know, absolutely, and we should offer it with the best of our abilities, you know. Yeah, just exposure, you know. That's true. So, like, even you know, there's a lot that that goes on that we don't share on social media because also you're worried about overexposing mm -hmm. and also looking like you're bragging, yeah. you know. But you know, I get messages in boxes sometimes from people I never thought, you know, were, not, were noticing, you know, who will say, yo, we see you mm. and we appreciate it, you know. Mm. So that exposure, you know, is encouraging a, a lot of people that you would not meet under normal circumstances. Very you know? true. So thank you for coming up with this. Yeah. And hopefully it goes into something even bigger. Yeah. Know? Yeah, you and Mr. President, brother, in a, in a vintage. <laughs> Thank you so much. Actually, uh, we've got one of these. Um, if you watched Collusion, yeah, we didn't crash the actual. Oh, now I'm spoiling it for everyone. <laughs> okay. So, but we've got the car. Okay. So I'll show it to you. I think you'll like it. It's, okay. It's really the one that that guy drives in. in oh in, yeah. Yeah, we've got that. It's really nice with the rims. Oh, so it's you, it's you guys? It's, yeah, it's, oh. the car is there. Oh, okay. I, actually, I should get you to see it. Maybe you might want to take that one. <laughs> it's very nice. It's okay. Very nice. I actually want to put the, the new dash. Oh, yeah. The new C-Class dash. Oh. And the seats. And then just leave it the way it is outside. Yeah. I mean, I think these things you can do so much, Kato. It's yeah, like, and this is, uh, in C -B -B -B, this is a true car. Yeah, yeah. You know? I've seen somebody put an AMG C6... Uh, C63, I saw yeah, that C63. too. That's where I'm getting the idea from. The whole... Everything is electronic. It's like a C63 inside and the engine. It's just the body. Mm. And that thing... It's heavy, but it, it moves like crazy. I mean, yeah. That's what I want to do. No, nice one, brother. Thank, Thank you so, so much, much. Mel. All right. Thank you. All right, so we're out. Boom! You know, so I'm going to...